let us pray. Speak to us now, Lord, in the stillness of this hour. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. John Wesley said, making an open stand against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness which overspreads our land as a flood is one of the noblest ways of confessing Christ in the face of his enemies." Unquote. Indeed, this morning, this is a crucial word to us, particularly against the background of the scriptures that the scripture passages that were read with the emphasis on the passage from Isaiah and Romans calling us to a change of life. As I indicated earlier, today is Advent Lord's Day, the start of the church's liturgical calendar. And over the first four Sundays, we are expected to focus on the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm well aware that our celebration for Christmas will come in along that time, but let us try as much as possible through the readings and the reflection of God's word to focus on that very important expectation, the second coming of the Lord Jesus. It is easy for us to be religiously wrapped up in preparing at this time. For example, we may sing the appropriate hymns as we have done this morning. And then we can also reflect on the associated passages of scripture. But that is not all it is to it, as important as those things are. We as committed Christians can even rededicate our lives to Jesus Christ, something that we will normally be doing from time to time. However, a crucial aspect of our Advent preparations is the way in which we presently live in communities and the value system that we will embrace. Will we as a people of God seek determinedly and purposefully to live in Jesus Christ? Would we as people of God take in with us the value system indicated by Jesus Christ? Will we seek to promote this value system in all aspects of our lives? Not only domestically, but also in business and commerce. Undoubtedly, there is a huge scourge on our country, this and others, in relation to crime and violence, which is a worldwide problem. With bloodshed and mass abuse occurring. Indeed, each of us will feel the pinch. For in a cultural and civilized nation such as ours, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we cannot escape the effect. For even though a particular ill may not be occurring in our homes directly, if it occurs in our villages and in our towns, then we are affected as well. 
And we have to be very careful as a nation to work together, to do all we can to remove as many ills as we can from our living situations. Because if we allow the stream of, as, for example, crime and violence to continue, we will all be destroyed in its path. Of course, the government and other agencies and we ourselves, out of our desire, are working towards a skilled and educated, well-educated society. And we are well on the way to achieving this. But we have to continue to be family-centered, and we have, to be, we have to continue to be respectful of all persons. And respect is not based only on age. We don't demand respect when we become an adult and then ignore it to those who are younger than us. We have to respect those who are younger than us in the same way that we expect them to respect us. Respect works both ways. We have to respect persons in our homes in the same way that we will respect individuals who are over us in our workplaces. We must respect each other as we play games together, even when we are on the losing side, whether it is playing directly or hailing for a team, as will occur now with the World Cup going on. We have to be respectful people at all times and very family-centered. We must therefore realize that as we go through this Advent period 2022, that it brings us pretty much at a crossroad and any hope of living happy lives tomorrow depends on us committing to the right way to live today. We must so commit to living right uprightly today that it will give us hope for a bright tomorrow. It is important then, my sisters and brothers, that we all recognize that there's one fundamental thing, and that is that we are accountable to God for how we live our lives, and we are duty-bound to do so in accordance with God's dictates. Not everyone that we come in contact with, or even those who we live with, will be committed Christians, although we keep praying for that to happen. But yet, at the same time, we must remind persons that we are accountable to God for how we live. And one of the basics on which we prepare ourselves for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is to recognize that that coming will be accompanying the judgment when we will be answerable for how we live our lives. And if we ever want a good way on which to pave our lives, it is the way that has been set for us by our Lord Jesus Christ. It means, therefore, that we must keep our eye on our behaviors and, where necessary, reverse any trends when wrongdoing have overtaken our lives and urgent corrective action is required to avoid our destruction. And so I believe that in a real sense, our earnest prayer must be for the healing of the land. And the healing of the land is not just about the material services of, of 
rocks and dirt, we're really talking about all of us. When we talk about the hill of the land, we are talking about all in that land. Animals, trees, we ourselves, etc. This passage of scripture that we have used as our text today challenges us. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. These words form part of that marvelous letter by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome as he wrote to encourage them for he had planned to pay a missionary visit to them and to minister among them for a while. Of course, history will show that that never happened the way that Paul envisages it. And even though he went to Rome, he did not go there as a free person. And while he would have had an opportunity to minister to persons who would have come to him while he was under house arrest, it was not the kind of widespread ministering that he had in mind. At that time, the Christians in Rome not only had to deal with persecution for one reason or the other, and in fact, we are told that the reason why this Christian community had developed in Rome is because persons had run away from other places because of the persecution against the church generally. But in addition to what was happening to them on the outside, there was also, like us, the inner struggle that was continuing with evil seeking to overthrow good. You and I must admit that that's the inner struggle that we have all the time. In fact, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote in this very book, the Romans indicated that as he lamented that the things that he wanted to do, he found it very difficult to do. And the things that he did not want to do, those were the very things he did. And he summed it up, O oh, wretched man that I am, and as though crying out in lament and hopelessness, somehow he was able to come to the realization, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. That is our answer as well. For we cannot deal with these situations alone. Beating souls into plowshares and spears into puning hooks as Isaiah spoke about, are not simply done. For we are not talking here about equipment. We are talking about a change of behavior, a change of our character, the internal change that we Methodists call sanctification and the transformation of our lives that result. This changed behavior must first start in the mind, propelled by a burning desire to be transformed away from bitterness. And you and I must have that desire. You and I must want to be changed. You and I must want the Lord to carry out his will and his way in our lives. Bitterness conjures up all sorts of ill emotions which propel evil schemes and plans. It is very interesting that in the passage that we read, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, it speaks of the world that the prophet saw. In other words, he saw a renewing of the mind. And I'm reminded of two 
powerful verses from the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then we have Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, a verse that I love so much. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. For us Christians, Jesus is the light of the world. And walking in this light demands that in addition to a constant change in our thinking, we must surrender our lives to him. There's no option really if we want to see the change come about. There's no option for it is not we accept the Lord and we, or we ignore him, and if we ignore him, things will still go okay. It wouldn't go okay. And so we are talking here about the complete rule of God over our lives. We talk very often about the kingdom of God. And when we mention about the kingdom of God, that is really what we are talking about for God to so completely rule our lives that he become the number one in our existence before striving to do that which he calls us to do. This is fundamental to our living as Christians and bringing about the change that is necessary. Of course, we must not expect that these things are going to just happen like magic overnight. No. For just as God will carry out his work within us through the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in Romans 12, we must keep submitting ourselves as living sacrifices to God. There is something, though, that we have to keep at the front burner at all times, and that is recorded in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In so doing, we firstly receive forgiveness for our wrongs as we confess our sins to God. And then we are expected to forgive those who have wronged us. So while we are being forgiven, we also have to forgive. And of course, we have to recognize that it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the inner strength that we need as we submit to the power of God, breaking us and remolding us. A well-known Charles Wesley hymn carries this stanza. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me, unquote. We need to send the good news that we are not beyond redemption. We are not beyond transformation. Regardless of what may have happened in the past, whether we want to call it a generational or ancestral curse, that can be broken by the blood of Jesus Christ upon our lives. 
And so this morning, through believing in Jesus Christ and confession of our sins, we may first of all receive forgiveness and a new life in Christ. And I want to say to all of us, yes, our lives can be turned around. Turned around from the situation of dreadful social problems of crime and violence and others. And I therefore call upon us today to submit our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, and we making a determined effort to walk in his light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word ministered to us from Holy Scripture. We thank you that your word is not only a light and a guide to us, but your word represents the powerful change that can come about in our lives when we submit ourselves totally to your will and to your way. If you bow our heads in your presence now, God, even as you once more tug at our heartstrings, enable us to open ourselves to you even more, to commit ourselves to you more totally than we have done in the past. Enable us, O oh God, to freely give you your way in our lives, pledging to be yours unconditionally. Take charge, Lord. Move within us. And even at this time, as we go through this period of Advent, help us not simply to go through the religious rituals, but help us each week, each day, each hour, to so search our lives before you, that we deliberately submit ourselves to your ministering. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.